Okay. Hello, everyone, my Quest Juniors. So uh, this particular lecture, sorry, my cords are kind of going crazy here. Let me readjust, there we go. Um, this particular lecture, it's happening after we're already back. So this is a backup, essentially. I would like, if I can, to try to lecture simultaneously with the students who are here present and then the students on Zoom. This may be difficult with a mask on and, and you know walking back and forth. So we're gonna try it, see if it works. But this is the backup for those of you at home, if you can't quite hear or you want, you know, a little more um, you know, up close instruction and et cetera, and you're used to the way I've done it, then this is your backup. It'll be on YouTube and you guys can refer to it whenever you like. Um, so we're now in the 70s, um, the 60s, this transformative decade. Um, it's, it's hard to pin down exactly what's happening. Is it a liberal time? Well, it is, but conservatism doesn't disappear. Um, in the midst of the hippie movement, Ronald Reagan gets elected governor in California and he's, you know, buttoned down, suit and tie, didn't like the hippies, didn't like the student movement, didn't like the Black Panthers. Same thing with Richard Nixon. He's elected two years later, a conservative during a very liberal time. So half of America, generally the older, whiter, suburban, you know, middle and upper class part, um, does not like a lot of these changes. They're on board with civil rights. They're probably on board with women's rights, but they don't like the rioting that's going on in, in big cities. They don't like uh, how liberal the Supreme Court has gotten, changing everything. And um, they elected conservatives at the same time, sort of as a backlash against everything that was going on. Then we get into the 70s where it seems like if you wanted to chart what's actually going on in the 60s, you would really chart the 60s as, to me, November of 63 when Kennedy is assassinated up through the resignation of Richard Nixon in August of 60, uh, 74, excuse me. Um, and so uh, this 10 year period here, that's what I would call the 60s. If you're looking at 1961, Eisenhower is still president for that first month. You know, there's no hippies. There's no Vietnam War. There's, you know, the women's movement hasn't even gotten off the ground at that point. There's no Civil Rights Act. There's no Voting Rights Act. Um, and so that's really the decade that we're looking at. So when we're in 1970, 71, 72, 73, to me, that's still the 60s. And it's, you know, it's probably appropriate to think of it like that. Uh, things don't calm down until Nixon resigns. And then we kind of go into a conservative period in American history. So this picture uh, at the beginning of our slide sort of exemplifies the attitude in general in the 70s. It had been a very nice 30 year period from the end of World War II up to about 1973, 74. And then there were simultaneously multiple signs that America's best days might be behind it. That there was this glory age from the end of World War II where we stood astride the world like a colossus economic might, military might, and, and more than anything, moral right, meaning, uh, or moral might. We, we had conquered the Nazis, we had conquered the Japanese, we were behaving, in my opinion, much more civilized than the Soviets and trying to build a democratic capitalist new world order, giving money to other countries through the Marshall Plan, building the United Nations. That, and th that age of prosperity benefited us and most of the world's population. And then it all kind of came crashing down in the 70s. Now, I don't want to oversell it. America still will be a global superpower. And we are still today. But a lot had changed. And, and the signs were on the wall. The picture here uh, is of American hostages in Tehran, the capital of Iran, which had a revolution in 1979 and shocked the world and shocked us. First of all, that a country could turn on us. And second, that a weak, poor, underdeveloped country could hold our people hostage and pretty much get away with it without hardly any repercussions whatsoever. By the way, we're still uh, on very uh, uneasy terms with the nation of Iran. They're one of the three or four countries in the world that we consider to be enemies. We don't like the Russians, we don't like the Chinese, but we hate Iran, North Korea, Cuba. You know, those are the main ones that just, you know, our nation states we don't get along with at all and are in fact, uh, you know, enemies of us. So um, let's talk about the 70s. We're gonna ditch all the tie dye and stuff and we're gonna get some platform shoes and get ready to disco. That's the fun stuff, right? 
Okay, so um, let's talk about Richard Nixon. Being from California, being from Orange County, I gotta say, it's it's hard to completely hate on Richard Nixon. Sure, he, um, in, well, I mean, presidency is a difficult thing to wrap your head around. So in some ways he was a tremendous president. He created the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. He um, continued on with civil rights and desegregation. Um, his nominees to the Supreme Court were conservative. So there was more of a balance there against the liberals, but not completely right wing and nutty and, and wedded to any ideology or the other. They just were a bit more conservative in their just jurisprudence added for more balance on the court. Um, he, uh, he was very capable, smart, intelligent man. However, his, uh, darker side, his demons would essentially bring him down. Richard Nixon was one of the most paranoid people we've ever had in, in government. He thought there were plots against him everywhere. He assumed the media was out to get him. The Democrats were out to get him. The Soviets were out to get him. The anti-war movement was out to get him. The civil rights movement was out to get him. And that they were all meeting in secret and plotting his demise. And um, this kind of paranoia completely brought him down because he behaved in ways that were completely irrational and crossed the line into illegality. Almost from the very beginning, uh, Richard Nixon was suffering from big problems as president. He uh gets in there he inherits a war that we just cannot win and he doesn't quite know how to handle the vietnam situation um there were violent demonstrations all over the place with the invasion of cambodia you had student uh movements and, and riots uh, erupt on every college campus in the country um it was not an easy presidency and, and i sympathize with him but he completely overreacted and took the wrong tack so this leads us into Watergate. It's hard to say, but it, it, at this point, but it still remains perhaps the worst political scandal in the country's history. And uh, it, it captivated the nation and people could not believe the depravity of the 37th president of the United States. It was, it was a pretty pitiful and dismal show. Nixon was born to... Um, very meager conditions in Yorba Linda, California. His father was a lemon rancher. They had no money. He was a Quaker, you know, simple folk, but he was very hardworking. He was a World War II veteran uh, and he worked his way up through the ranks, going to Whittier College and then after the war becoming a uh, congressman. Um, in 1946, he runs for Congress and gets elected. He was pretty young at that particular time. I think he was... Um, in his late 20s, you know, uh, not, you know, middle-aged at all. Uh, he becomes vice president under um, Dwight Eisenhower. He builds a name for himself as a strong anti-communist, but not nearly in the camp of like Joe McCarthy, who, you know, would just smear people without evidence. Nixon always had the receipts and caught Alger Hiss in, in a lie uh, and, uh, and really wowed a lot of people in the Republican establishment. Um, it's hard to imagine, but California used to be a solidly Republican state and Orange County used to be solidly conservative. It's not so much anymore. It's it's changed quite a bit. It voted for Hillary Clinton in, in 2016 uh, and in 2020, it mostly voted for Joe Biden. Um, so Nixon comes out of this political, you know, broth or stew in, in Orange County, California, kind of middle class, you know, suburban life and um, rises through the ranks, loses to JFK in 1960, but comes back in 1968. And America was sort of saying, we're sorry, we got it wrong in 1960. Ever since, you know, JFK got killed, just the country's, you know, gone to hell. We want you to bring back law and order and all of it, you know, to make America a wonderful place again. So uh, Nixon, because he saw all this chaos and turmoil, he imagined that every person marching, protesting, demonstrating, causing problems, the Black Panthers, the Nation of Islam, uh, even more moderate groups like SNCC and CORE in the civil rights movement, the Weathermen, um, all of these people he assumed were either communist agents or being bankrolled by the Soviet Union. Why was he so paranoid? Well, I said this about J. Edgar Hoover, I think, last time. He knew, because he had been vice president and you know knew a lot of secrets, the CIA, he knew about the rigged elections in Italy, and he knew about the coup in Iran and Guatemala. And so he assumed the Soviets were doing the same exact thing we were, which 
they were and they weren't. They weren't quite as sophisticated. They just said, we're going to just out and out murder our opposition and the countries we occupy, Czechoslovakia, Poland, etc. They weren't ashamed at all of, of doing those kind of things. They had no need to rig elections because there were no elections in communist countries. Uh, so they did things a bit differently, more brutally, more upfront, more in your face. Uh, but Nixon assumed that that's what they were doing. They were finding disaffected groups in America and paying them to arm them, equip them, and march and demonstrate and just cause problems. Um, and this, of course, there was no evidence behind it. The FBI looked into all of this. They looked into MLK's bank records and all these groups, and there was no affiliation. It was absurd. And so in one meeting in 1971, Nixon's talking to J. Edgar Hoover, and uh, Hoover just tells them, we're going to have to suspend all these wiretaps. None of these people have any communist connections. And I was already pretty much skirting the law by granting uh, these wiretaps, but we can't do this anymore. Nixon became enraged and founded his own counterintelligence agency uh, uh, called the Plumbers. In a perhaps clever or not so clever uh, nod to the fact that their job was to stop leaks. Uh, the Nixon administration had a very leaky government. A leak doesn't mean literally water. It talks about an information leak, right? You have some secret that you talked about in a meeting, and then that's leaked out to the press. Um, American politics is quite interesting, is that the press is allowed, they have the freedom of speech to essentially just talk to sources in the government and report on it, and the government cannot ask them who their source was and, you know, uh, try to prosecute them, even if it's a well-kept confidential secret. There's a few exceptions, you know, people went after Obama because he had prosecuted more, um, more of these leakers than anyone else. But I looked into it and I think Obama prosecuted seven or eight people for this. And it was very um, valuable information, like troop locations in Afghanistan, things like that, right? Not like, oh, I had a meeting with someone and someone said something to me at this meeting and, and I'm gonna arrest them and prosecute them for that. In any case, Nixon created the plumbers to essentially monitor press leaks and, and try to go after his enemies because uh, there were leaks all over the place. So he uh, gets deeper and deeper and deeper into this situation. He was incredibly enraged in 1971 that there was a gentleman by the name of Daniel Ellsberg who was a Pentagon analyst who was overseeing the study of the Vietnam War. The Pentagon was sort of troubled with why are we not winning the war? And, you know, let's publish this report. It was a multi-thousand page study. Daniel Ellsberg photocopied every single page of it for months and then released it to the New York Times and the New York Times published it. And it was shocking. Uh, in the Pentagon Papers, as it was called, was the evidence that the U.S. government had faked the Gulf of Tonk Tonkin incident, that it was not a real event where the North Vietnamese Army and Navy fired on U.S. destroyers. So the whole reason we got into the war, we found out, was a lie. Every week of the war, all the body counts, how well we were doing, the fact that we were, you know, winning, we were not winning. And um, all of this was in the Pentagon Papers, and everyone in America, 71 is a low moment for the Vietnam War. Popularity drops well below 50%. It gets into the 30s. And most people just say, forget it. Let's just get out. We're not going to win this. The government's been lying. Uh, you have conservatives saying, well, we should win this war, but the government's incompetent. We got to get out. And you have liberals saying this is an immoral war because the government's lying and we're killing people. We don't need to be there. Let's get out. So Nixon decides he wants to prosecute Ellsberg. Hoover says, under the laws as they are, I can't. There's these whistleblower statutes. He's allowed to do it. Nixon is stunned how this guy working against our interests in Vietnam and, and damaging US reputation and leaking secrets can't be prosecuted. So Nixon uh, wants the plumbers to take care of Ellsberg. Now, Nixon wasn't at these meetings with the plumbers saying, I want you to do all these illegal things, but he deputized people to do that. His attorney general, John Mitchell, and then all these other people had meetings with the plumbers. The plumbers were all sort of ex-FBI, ex-CIA people. They were sort of thugs for hire. And they came up with a plan to break into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office uh, to find some embarrassing secret. Maybe he likes to wear ladies' underwear, or maybe he's a weirdo or whatever. Maybe he has mommy issues. We'll get whatever he told a psychiatrist and then we'll leak it to the press and we'll damage him and we'll go after him. Um, 
this of all, first of all, is highly illegal. And it's compounded by the fact that you have to cover it up, right? Because it's illegal and you don't want to get caught, you got to pay the burglars. You got to make sure that they're on the payroll. How do you get money to pay these people? You know, presidents aren't actually incredibly rich people to, you know, own a business and pay workers. And you can't pay them out of the U.S. Treasury because all of that has to go back to Congress and you have to tell them where the money went to. So it was decided that these burglars would be paid with laundered money from the RNC, from the Republican National Committee. So that's strike two. You have, first of all, the authorization of breaking in, which is a misdemeanor, but then covering it up with money laundering is now a felony. And so Nixon's in waist deep now. Now the, the operation is a failure. It doesn't achieve anything. Uh, they don't find anything on Ellsberg, but the crime is done and there's a record of it essentially. And there's dozens of these. We, we often get wrapped up in Watergate and we think of it literally the break in at the Watergate. There were dozens of these operations. They had the craziest schemes you might imagine. Nixon believed he would be defeated in 1972. And so, and he thought in his paranoid and very arrogant way that the Democratic Party was being funded by the communists, by the Soviet Union. And if they won, the US would lose the Cold War and we would become a communist nation. So perhaps his heart was in the right place, but his head was, forgive me, where the sun don't shine. He had his head in a, in a bad location and just thought the craziest things. So they launched all these operations to sabotage the Democrats. There's this weird notion today that people forget how Watergate went down and they say, Nixon just sabotaged himself. He was so worried he'd lose the 72 election and he stomped all over the Democrats. He destroyed them. It was the greatest landslide in the 20th century which is partially true. He did defeat uh, George McGovern in that 72 race, but understand McGovern was the guy he ran against and Nixon effectively rigged the Democratic primary. McGovern was a far left candidate. He was from Massachusetts. He wanted to end the war. He was a you know, very, very, very liberal person. It would be like Bernie Sanders or AOC winning the nomination today uh, in 2021. Um, and instead, you know, Joe Biden won and, you know, Biden's kind of the more centrist candidate. In the 70s, that was uh, Ed Edmund Muskie of Maine. He was a centrist Democrat in all the polls in the spring of 72. That was the one Nixon and, uh, and the plumbers were terrified of. They said, if we go up against Muskie, we're going to lose. So we have to destroy him. And you see these memos, you know, we have to poke the sharp stick at Muskie and he has to be cut and bleeding in these first primaries and we have to sabotage him. So they did. They broke into his office, the plumbers did, and they stole his stationery. Now, I don't even know if you guys know what stationery is, but it's basically paper that you write letters on with like a letterhead, like from the desk of, you know, whoever, you know, Edmund Muskie or whatever. And it's sort of pre-printed up at a stationery shop. And so when you receive a letter from that person, you know it's authentic because it's published on his stationery. It's kind of like, you know, it's the equivalent today of like your at your friend's house and they're in the bathroom and you get on their computer or phone and they're already logged into social media and you can post and people think it's them, right? And so you always put embarrassing stuff in there, right? Like, oh, Nickelback's my favorite band, you know, post. And then all of the person's friends make fun of them for a week because, you know, you went into their account and said that, right? So they steal the stationery and they publish all these letters on it, really bad kind of gossip, right? Like, you know, it looks like it's coming from Muskie and it's like, Democrats vote for me because I'm the only one who can win. And we know that Senator Jackson is gay. And we know that, you know, Senator Jones has an illegitimate child out of wedlock. And they just made up all these rumors to make it look like Muskie was talking trash against all the Democrats. Muskie then just implodes. He just has a nervous breakdown because he comes out to the press and he said, there was a break in, someone stole my stationery and no one believes him, not even the press. You're trying to cover it up. What a lame lie. No one would steal your stationery, Muskie. You're paranoid. This is ridiculous. No, he was correct. And he broke down crying live uh, on television at one of these rallies because there were multiple operations like this um, that just embarrassed him. So he steps aside. George McGovern runs and he gets stomped in an embarrassing fashion. McGovern wins the state of Massachusetts, his home state and the District of Columbia, and that's it. Richard Nixon wins the other 49 states and annihilates him. Even the unions turned on him. The unions thought that um, McGovern was way too liberal and they backed the Republican Richard Nixon the first time they would do it and they would do it again and with Ronald Reagan in the 80s. 
um, very much to their detriment, actually. The Republicans don't like the unions, but they didn't like kind of how union or uh, the Democratic Party was embracing, you know, anti-war movement people and, you know, angry protesters and the like. So Nixon successfully rigged this election. Um, if you want to look at it that way, and I certainly do, you rig the primary, you kind of rig the election, right? This would be, you know, like if somehow, you know, the Republicans engineered it that Bernie Sanders got the nomination and lost. We all know Joe Biden won now, and that would be the candidate that would have won and that the voters wanted if you somehow rigged that and got in someone else. I'm not saying Bernie would have lost, but let's say theoretically that he would. That would be the similar thing that happened in 72. You sabotage the candidate that you're afraid of, and then you go up against the weaker one. Bravo. Good job, Nixon. Problem is, it's highly illegal. Uh, this scandal did not come out until years later, but but it's part of the Watergate. Where they got caught is they got greedy. After they sabotaged Muskie, they then bug, they wiretapped the phone at the DNC. They, want, they assumed that the Democratic National Committee was taking calls with Leonid Brezhnev. If you don't know who that is, it's the premier of the Soviet. They thought they would catch some ridiculous moment like that. And it was absurd to think that. And so they overstepped, they bugged the phones. The bugs weren't working and were malfunctioning. So the burglars had to break into the water gate again to replace the wiretap. And they got caught embarrassingly by the night watchman. They had put like duct tape over one of the door locks to keep it open. And the night watchman caught it, removed the tape, and then came back about 20 minutes later and the tape was back on and he knew something was going on. So he calls the cops, the cops show up and they catch five or six of these burglars in the DNC. And it looks very weird. They're all dressed very nicely in three piece suits. They all have rubber gloves on. They all have very sensitive recording devices, the stuff NASA uses to talk to the astronauts. And the police have no idea what the heck is going on. The next morning they're arraigned, they're brought before a judge and it's highly irregular. Again, these people, all these men all had three piece suits, rubber gloves, sensitive recording equipment, thousands of dollars on them in hundred dollar bills in sequential order, fresh from the bank. It seemed very odd, uh, yet they were not talking. None of them were saying anything, but when they checked their employment records, most of them had worked for the CIA or FBI. And so it looked like maybe the DC police had stumbled into, stumbled into a CIA operation. Richard Helms, the head of the CIA says, there is nothing these people have to do with the CIA. This is not. Somebody hired these people, but it's unclear. Immediately, Richard Nixon denies any knowledge of it. All of his aides say, we have no idea what's going on. And most people thought, this is such a crazy thing. These guys are just out on their own doing this. They're some outside group. There's no way Richard Nixon would have done this. And when he sales to a very easy victory in November of 72. Everybody says just, it's some kooky kind of thing. Well, the law enforcement essentially followed the money, kept looking into it, and the conspiracy got deeper and deeper and deeper. They uh, start to trace the money on these men to a bank in Mexico, and then trace that back to the RNC. So they know that someone at the RNC is paying these people. I mean, that's pretty big, right? They're laundering money to cover their, laundering it poorly. They don't really know what they're doing, but, but just the attempt is bad enough. Uh, and they keep looking into it. And they, you know, day after day after day, the, the conspiracy just compounds itself. It doesn't go away. Uh, in early 1973, it's determined that two top aides of Nixon, his chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, uh, and the deputy chief, John Ehrlichman, both were involved in this very deeply. Now, Nixon threw him to the wolves, basically. He cut him loose. He, to save himself, pointed the finger at them and said, they did it all. I'm firing them and we're going to move on. I had no idea about any of this. Now, it's not clear exactly what Richard Nixon knew, but there is no evidence that he knew prior to the break-in what was approved. He probably just gave carte blanche and said, I want you guys you know, to, to handle all the press leaks. But he certainly knew of the cover-up, and we know he knew of the cover-up because Nixon, not the smartest criminal, he taped himself. He recorded every conversation for two years in the Oval Office from 71 to 73 because he was so paranoid about leaks. He wanted to have every conversation on record so they could recreate who was in the room and who's likely to be the leakers, and, and I want to be able to blackmail them if ever they're going to turn against me. And this was his downfall. 
Now, no one knew that they were all being recorded, but some people suspected they might be because the president would often ask leading questions at these meetings. And so the Senate starts having these um, investigation hearings. They start to bring up witnesses. And the president's attorney, uh, John Dean, turns on the president because it looked like Nixon was going to throw him to the wolves, too. And so he decided to turn the tables on Nixon and testify to the Senate and say, I was guilty in Watergate and I'm going to cut a deal for immunity. The president knew everything. He knew everything after the fact anyway about the cover up and everything. All the other witnesses testify that the president did not know. And so you got John Dean on the one side, you got everybody else and everyone's debating in the summer of 1973. What did the president know and when did he know it? You know, we have no idea. And then it finally comes out that the president taped himself. So we got to get our hands on the tapes. They subpoena the president. The president says, I don't have to turn over these tapes. They're my personal property. There's executive privilege. I'm the president. You can't just, you know, ask me for, you, know, you can't just subpoena the president like I'm a citizen. I'm the president, right? Um, and so there's this back and forth. The courts get involved. So this is, you know, a dream for political science majors and checks and balances and those that love, you know, Madison and Hamilton is how this would actually work. It goes back and forth and there's negotiations and they come up with this crazy scheme where Senator Stennis, who is nearly deaf, is going to listen to these tapes and then make transcripts to make sure they're authentic and then release the transcripts. And the courts say, no, we want the actual tapes. We want to know everything. It goes to the Supreme Court. And in, uh, in the summer of 1974, the Supreme Court finally says, you got to turn over the tapes. Nixon, in the midst of this, fires the special prosecutor. There's this fundamental problem with the executive branch, and that's that the executive branch is the law enforcement. They investigate everybody else. But what if the executive himself, the president, is breaking the law? That's a conflict of interest, right? It's like your friend that you nominated for attorney general is going to investigate you. Won't they just do a bad job and let you off the hook? And so this is always the problem with law enforcement. That's why whenever the police are investigated, they bring in an outside agency like internal affairs that's not accountable to the general police force and they investigate the police. Same thing with the executive branch, this you know, quasi-independent agency called the Office of Independent Counsel or the Special Prosecutor, they investigate the president. Technically, the president can still fire them, but because there's such a conflict of interest, it's a dangerous thing politically to do. And that's exactly what Richard Nixon did. He fired Archibald Cox, the man investigating him. And it seemed like this was a blatant obstruction of justice. He was covering it up. Fire the prosecutor so the prosecutor can't you know, investigate him. It was a huge blunder. It just turned up the volume of every everyone who was ignoring this before all of a sudden said, what is the president hiding if he's firing the prosecutor investigating him? A lot of people thought that there'd be tanks on the street, that Nixon would you know, order the tapes destroyed and you know, arrest everyone investigating him. Luckily, he did not. Um, but going into 1974, things were just getting out of control. Um, war broke out in the Middle East and it just got drowned off the page. We very nearly got into a nuclear confrontation with the Soviets in the Yom Kippur War in the Middle East. Luckily, we did not. But that just got blasted off the page because everyone was talking about Watergate. So this continues. The Supreme Court orders him to turn over the tapes. He finally does. And he's just guilty as sin. It's just obvious. He's just one instance after the other, after the other, ordering the cover-ups, ordering the payment of hush money, ordering all kinds of horrible things, ordering the CIA to call the FBI and call off the investigation. It was very clear Nixon was using his power of his office to protect himself. And it was all on tape. And even the most ardent Republican listened to that and they just said, this is despicable. The man has got to go. So the House started looking at articles of impeachment after this quote unquote smoking gun tape comes out where Nixon's heard on there ordering the CIA to tell the FBI to stop investigating him. Uh, and there's a vote of the House Judiciary Committee that overwhelmingly says we're, we need to impeach the president. Now it was not yet at the full House of Representatives. That was like a week away. This is August of 74, but it's a foregone conclusion. The president is going to be impeached. The only question is, will he be convicted? And so the Democrats basically said, yeah, he's a liar. He's got to go. We don't like him. But you need Republicans because it takes two thirds vote. It's going to take 67 senators. And Barry Goldwater and several other uh, uh, Republicans go and visit Richard Nixon 
in uh, late July of 74 and they tell them it's over, you got to go, that there's going to be 90 votes against you in the Senate. It's going to be embarrassing. It's going to further drag you into the mud. It's going to damage the country and it will end with your conviction and you're going to lose your pension because once you're impeached and convicted, you're banned from ever running for federal office again. And that includes pension holder. Nixon hadn't had a real job in his entire life. All he had done is the military, congressman, vice president, president. He hadn't done anything else in his, his entire life. He was not a rich man. And all, all he was going to get was this pension. And he did not want to die poor and alone and, you know, have to go to prison. So he decided to resign, first president and only president ever to resign. And his vice president, Gerald Ford, comes to power. In a weird wrinkle to this scandal, uh, Nixon's own vice president, Spiro Agnew, had to resign because he apparently was the only one in the government even more corrupt than Richard Nixon. He had a double scandal. He was taking bribes, basically. Uh, he had been governor of Maryland and still, as vice president, had a lot of pull in Maryland. And um, what he would do is construction companies would literally come to the White House with a bag of cash and give him cash payments. And then he would use his influence to give contracts to these construction firms in Maryland for big state projects, you know, highways and stuff like that. So he was A, taking bribes and B, not paying taxes on it. And so the IRS got him and the FBI got him and Spiro Agnew had to resign. Richard Nixon nominated Gerald Ford to be his new vice president and then Richard Nixon resigned. So Gerald Ford remains the only president to this day that's never been elected to the presidency, right? Because be, normally you're elected vice president and then you assume the presidency. Gerald Ford wasn't elected to vice president. He was just nominated after the previous one had resigned. So luckiest guy in the world. He didn't last too long as president, about the same as Kennedy's term, about two years and 10 months. And his first action was to pardon Richard Nixon, just to forgive him. Ford, um, many people praised him for his wisdom. It's hard to say whether it was the right move or not. It certainly angered a lot of people and it, it essentially sealed his fate for not being able to be reelected because most people felt, well, this was just corruption and dealing in favors and you just pardon Richard Nixon, you know, because he's your friend. Um, and uh, Gerald Ford argued that that was not the issue. There was no deal like I'll make you president and you pardon me. Instead, he argued this was to heal the nation. The, the only thing that would happen if we went forward is it would divide the country and damage us and make us look bad. And uh, we need to just forgive and move on. Richard Nixon's paid the ultimate price. Let's not, you know, try to go after a guy unnecessarily. And so he's pardoned and that effectively ends the whole affair. Nixon lives for 20 years after his resignation. I remember when he died in 1994. I've been to the Nixon Library a bunch of times. It's in Yorba Linda. It's not too far from where I grew up in Garbage Grove. And uh, he's never really able to get out of the sh shadow of Watergate. He always falls in sort of the bottom five of presidents, which is a shame because he was highly intelligent and I would argue very effective as a governing figure. Um, but the illegality and the cover-up in that just far exceeded any positive that he did. Not the most incompetent president, but one of the most corrupt, if not the most corrupt ever. So uh, that was the Watergate scandal. And it still fascinates people, you know, to this day, the people that live through it. And um, it was not a good moment for American democracy. We were always prideful that democracy was the greatest system that other countries had nepotism and favoritism and corruption, but America did not. And it seemed like we were just another banana republic that you know men in power just behaved horribly, covered up crimes, rigged elections and got away with it. And sort of coupled together with Vietnam and all the lies and then the defeat, it shattered American confidence in itself. After World War II, it seemed like there was nothing we couldn't do. I mean, we could rig elections in Italy, we could topple governments around the, the globe, the economy boomed for 30 years consecutively, 40 years really, since 1937, since the Roosevelt recession until, you know, uh, until the mid 70s. And all of a sudden, uh, we've got a war that we lost. And the liberals would argue we were the bad guys in that war trying to dominate a foreign people. Uh, Nonetheless, certainly the government was lying and incompetent and lost us the war. And then we had this horrible failure of our democratic system, how a, a rogue president could break the law for years and get away with it. It was very dismaying. 
uh, when you watch these Watergate hearings, Democrats didn't revel in this. It wasn't like, you know, yay, we're getting rid of Richard Nixon. Grown men were crying on the floor of the House and Senate that America was shamed forever. Really, the Cold War, it intensified America's faith in itself, that we had to be the light of freedom to the world, that there were only two options here. It was Soviet communism or it was the American way. And what, how embarrassing and how shameful and how uh, disillusioning for other countries that want to mimic our, uh, our way of life. And uh, it, you can't even overstate it. The bicentennial is one of the most depressing celebrations ever. I wasn't around for it. I was born a few years later. But 1976, people were ready to have a good time. But most Americans, when you actually ask them, how do you feel about your country? And they say, I've never felt worse. I don't know if we can achieve anything. And there's nothing but problems on the horizon. Uh, and that loss of confidence was just, it was unthinkable just a few years before. In the 60s, America was riding high. And then things got worse. Uh, the economy had major problems in the 70s, huge problems that we just did not have any answers for. Coming out of the depression of World War II, a model was uh, created known as Keynesianism. Sort of the government was a sort of fine tuner of the economy and used a tremendous amount of leverage to tweak the economy to generate the results it wanted. And it worked very fine for us from the depression through the 70s Yet the 70s emerged with all these economic problems that there seemed to be no solution to, no government solution anyway. The first problem was the oil shock. Americans love the automobile. It's a weird thing. And, I, and today, this is part of the generation gap. My father is part of this generation. I don't get it. My father loves cars. And when I say loves cars, kind of in an unhealthy way. Like my father is sort of an amateur photographer. He's got tens of thousands of pictures. And I, I told him, I said, Dad, you better sort all that out because when you finally pass away, I'm not going through these 10,000 pictures. They're going in the garbage because I can't, I don't have the energy to look through them all. There's so many pictures of cars in there. It's like if, if this represents all the photos that he has, you know, it's really 10 times more. There's like this many of me and my brother, right? There's like 25 pictures through various stages of our lives infinitely more about cars. And it's not like I'm broken up about that. That's his hobby. He loves it. I don't get it. I don't get it. But my dad grew up in an era where cars were wonderful. They were this liberating thing where you could get in it and go and drive and do whatever you want. People were drag racing. People were cruising for fun. That's where you just get in your car and you just drive up and down PCH on a Friday night, just driving around. Gas was cheap. My dad in the 50s tells me it was like five, six cents for a gallon of gas because we had all the oil in the world. And whatever we, you know, uh, did not have in, in our own country that we had to import, um, we bought from Venezuela and Iran and Saudi Arabia. We had all the allies who had all the oil. And so it was fine. So America uh, created a society that was very energy inefficient because gas was cheap and we assumed it'd always be cheap. Each day that went by, we sucked more oil out of the ground here and we had to import more of it from abroad. During World War II, we used almost all of our own energy resources. Uh, and actually we're pretty good today too. The US actually produces more energy than it, um, than it consumes, mostly through hydro uh, fracturing or fracking as it's known. Um, but in the 70s and 80s, the US was driving these gas guzzlers and buying oil from abroad. And that arrangement, cozy as it was, you know, using one car, each of us to drive in and out of our suburbs and getting, you know, six, seven miles to the gallon in these gas guzzlers with no emission standards, um, that came crashing down in 1973. The war that I just described to you a moment ago, the Yom Kippur War, this is a war where Syria, uh, Egypt um, invaded Israel to regain the Sinai Peninsula and the West Bank. Uh, eventually failed in that endeavor, but it was a very rough moment there for in the fall of 1973 for Israel. And the US was its only ally. So the US airlifted a whole bunch of weapons to Israel to sort of bail it out there. And the Arab states in the region, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, you know, the UAE, Qatar, they all threatened the United States with an oil embargo if we intervened. They told us deliberately, do not aid Israel or we're going to cut off the oil, which 1973, America's at the height of its power and its arrogance. 
we're a rich country, you're a poor country, you can't do anything to us. You don't have the guts, you're not gonna do it. And even if you did, it won't do anything. Well, they did have the guts. They cut off the oil supply, not a drop of oil flowed out of the Middle East. We could still buy it from Iran, which amazingly Iran was an ally of ours in the mid seventies, Venezuela, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't nearly enough. And so the US stumbled to figure out exactly what to do. Gas prices doubled virtually overnight. They went from 40 cents to 70 cents in a day. I know that doesn't sound like a lot to you guys now, but you have to adjust for inflation. And this was shocking. This would be like if it went from $2 to $4 overnight, just overnight. Uh, and in the 70s, we still had this New Deal style of Keynesian economics, which we don't have today, right? Like in the 70s, um, gasoline was still controlled, meaning that the price of gasoline was set by the government. They basically met with the oil producers and said, at what price can you sell a gallon of gas and make a profit, but we can keep it low. And they would figure that out. And then the government would tell every gas station in the country, X for you know 87 unleaded and Y for uh, 89 unleaded and you know Z for 91 unleaded, diesel would be A, whatever. And they set the price nationwide, which is why you had all these young boys who would work uh, at uh, gas stations, they come out and, you know, wipe your window down and check your oil and light your cigarette, etc. Same thing with air travel. Air travel was heavily regulated by the FCC. Every airline had to charge an identical price. So didn't it matter if you traveled Pan Am or TWA, the price was the same, just the service would be different, right? Which is why they made a big deal about fly Pan Am. Our stewardesses are more attractive and younger. Most stewardesses, there was a policy that you would be terminated on your 34th birthday. That was as old as they wanted you because they wanted executives who were flying to be able to flirt with young, attractive stewardesses and uh, you know not have some 50 or 60 year old woman there. Uh, the meals were wonderful. There was unlimited beverage services with alcoholic beverages. The leg room was wonderful. Um, all that changed when they deregulated the airlines, but, but this was throughout America like this. And the only way the government could cope with the oil shortage was to try to keep the price low. It should have more than doubled, but the government put a ceiling on how high it could raise. So then there were shortages. People had to wait in lines like this. My mother tells me that when my brother and I were little kids, okay, because there were two oil shortages in the 70s. There was the 73 one from March, uh, or sorry, from October of 73 to March of 74 for five months. The Arab states boycotted America and there was huge spikes in oil prices. There was another one when Iran boycotted us in 1979. Uh, so I was just a few months old. My brother was three and my mother tells me she had to get up at three in the morning, multiple times a week, because you can only fill up about five gallons each time. And everybody drove a gas guzzler that got five miles to the gallon. And she had to go wait in a line like this at four in the morning with two little kids in the back seat for hours, sometimes two or three hours, so that you could get to the pump at 7 a.m., pump your five gallons, and then drive to work, and then wake up and do it all over again the next day. They also rationed with license plates. Basically, if your license plate ended in an odd number, you could only fill up on odd calendar days. What, if, what happens if you fill up on an even calendar day? Too bad, you, they would not fill up the gas tank. Uh, and so this, this was shocking to Americans. Americans had to put up with rationing of gasoline. The one thing we would not absolutely adhere to in World War II, we had to do it in peacetime. And people just said, what on earth is happening? Is this America or, or is it not? And the way we had set up our infrastructure in America was absolutely totally independent on oil. Energy prices went up because fuel prices are tied to, to electricity. That's how we created electricity in the 70s. It was, it was shocking. We lost our confidence in ourselves. It's like, this is the kind of stuff that happens in Nigeria where they have tons of oil, but the government steals it from the people and there's shortages and the people have to wait in lines like this. That's like in Cuba, when you wanna get meat, you gotta wait in line for two, three days. That's not America. Well, it was, and that's what was happening. And there was no solution. No one knew what to do. Um, this then fueled incredible inflation all throughout the 70s. We hadn't seen inflation like that since World War II. Prices skyrocketed of everything because energy prices went up, right? Anything that has to be carried by a truck is gonna be more expensive to, to carry. Energy prices of electricity went up. The price of everything went up in the 70s and Americans just shook their heads and said, what is happening? This, it's harder and harder to, to make a living anymore. The Paris Peace Accords 
uh, which we talked about before, was what got us out of Vietnam, and it was a sellout and a failure. Essentially, it took us eight years to lose the Vietnam War, and when people read the Accords, it was very plain. We were abandoning the South Vietnamese, and uh, and in shame, we left Vietnam. Two years later, there was a huge peace conference in Helsinki, Finland. Now, this is 30 years after the end of World War II. Remember, there is no peace agreement to end World War II. It's just sort of a series of ad hoc agreements from Potsdam and afterwards that never finally solved a lot of these issues. Still, in 1975, the US still said, we don't agree with the borders of East and West Germany. We want it united at some point, and we don't agree that there should be Soviet troops in Eastern Europe, et cetera, et cetera. In 1975, the European Union got together with the Soviets and held a peace agreement, and they did not invite the United States. They said, this is a European conference, and you're not a European country. Even though you're the head of NATO, and you got military bases all over the country, and you're the powerhouse here, you're not invited. And the Soviets were, because they're in Europe. And Europeans came to an agreement where they accepted the results of the end of the Second World War. They agreed with all the borders and where they were. The Soviets moved a lot of the borders of Poland and Germany and Latvia and Lithuania. And we shouted and screamed for decades and the Europeans just accepted it. They said, look, we don't need another war. We just need to move on and accept things the way they are. And this very much damaged our reputation and confidence. You guys are our European allies and you negotiated against our interests and didn't even invite us. It was humiliating, it was embarrassing. Starting in the seventies, Japan started to outproduce the US. We used to laugh at Japanese technology in the fifties and sixties but by the 70s, they had rebuilt and they made a huge inroad into the US auto market with the oil shortage because the Japanese had always been oil poor, never really had good resources. So Toyota and Honda always got great gas mileage. Honda Civic, uh, Honda Accord, Toyota Corolla, these cars would get you know 28, 32, 40 miles to the gallon. And Americans would laugh at them because Americans like to buy big, giant, huge cars like the Cadillac Eldorado, eight miles per gallon, right? No catalytic, catalytic converter on it. It just spewed out, you know, raw emissions. Well, Americans started buying Japanese cars because they said, I can't afford it at the oil prices it is now. So I'm going to do that. This is my mindset, right? A car is not this wonderful, beautiful thing that my dad thinks it is. I just want to get good gas mileage and it's a piece of transportation basically. And Americans more and more started to see cars that way and buy cars that were unattractive, but got good gas mileage and were you know good commuter cars. Um, Deunionization very much weakened the labor market. Nixon got the unions to support him in 72, then Reagan did in 80, and these Republican administrations kept appointing very conservative people to the head of the National Labor Relations Board, who again and again and again sided with management over unions. Union membership plummets. We lost about a third of all union membership just in the 70s. One by one, steel factories, steel mills closed, factories where we you know, manufactured rubber tires. These were closing and moving to Mexico and other countries not to China yet, because we didn't open up relations with China until 79, but moving factories offshore because labor costs are too high in America and breaking the backs of unions that way. And so we have a phenomenon that's happened since the 70s. The wage gap has increased in America. These working class jobs, wages have stagnated. Uh, it's very tough in America if you work at a job like Walmart as a cashier in an unskilled position, you often don't get health care. Wages are incredibly low. Um, the statistic that I read recently that was shocking was that in 1968, a, a factory employee at GM made about one thirtieth of what the CEO of GM made, meaning the CEO made 30 times what the factory employee did. Today, the most common job in America is cashier at Walmart. There's over a million of them, and they make one five hundredth of what the CEO of Walmart makes, meaning that the CEO makes 500 times what they make, which means that the economy has grown by leaps and bounds over the last 45 years, but most of that growth has gone to the top 1%. And this is something that we just sort of recognize. Now, it used to be kind of debated between Democrats and Republicans, but Republicans have jumped on board with this and said, yes, that the wealth gap is horrible and we need to do something, just not clear what, but union membership would be a good way back, but it, I don't see it coming back anytime soon. Uh, unions are very strong in most other countries. 
Not in America, they're very weak in this country. It's only the teachers union, the longshoremen union, the, the truckers union, the police union, that's about it. Most of it's in the public sector, in the, in the government employees, not in the private sector. Hardly anyone in the private sector has a union anymore. There was a big internal migration that started in the 70s. Uh, and it continues to this day from the Rust Belt to the Sun Belt. So the hardcore economic base of America used to be the Great Lakes region. It was towns like Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Youngstown and Fort Wayne, Indiana, and all these places along the Great Lakes that manufactured steel and cars, Detroit, Michigan, et cetera. And those places have taken a severe hit in the last 45 years. Uh, factories have closed one by one and new jobs because the economy is not a horrible economy it's quite good but the new jobs that have replaced it are typically high tech and those are in texas florida arizona and california those states balloon in size after the second world war and those traditional old areas where people used to move to ohio indiana illinois michigan upstate new york those are shedding population like no other ohio has lost population every year since the 70s Los Angeles becomes the second biggest city in America. It surpasses um, Chicago as number two. And um, it, that was sort of a sign of the times that the Sun Belt, sort of the South, but not, I don't mean the cultural South like Mississippi, I mean the geographic South, because these are states that I don't even consider the South, right? Texas, Florida, you know, Arizona and California. But this is the area that's growing. And California is not so much growing anymore. The state's pretty full. We have very high housing prices. But Texas is blowing up and Florida is absolutely blowing up right now. Um, that's a new phenomenon. So people start to move back. There's a weird reverse great migration going on now where many African-Americans are moving back to Atlanta, like their family had left Georgia 80 years ago to get, get out of Jim Crow. And many are moving back because housing prices are too much in California and other states. And, you know, Atlanta's growing right now. They're, you know, it's a very different Georgia than it was, you know, 70 years ago. New York City, the largest city in America, the site of the United Nations got worse and worse and worse and worse all through the 60s and 70s. Um, New York City uh, suffered you know, economic changes. They, um, the crime rate got worse and worse and worse there. So middle-class people started to move out. They then didn't have the tax base to run their schools. So they started cutting schools and garbage collection. Crime got worse and it was a sort of downward spiral. The city was atrocious in the 70s. Um, there's a fascinating documentary about this. It's called 1977 uh, New York City. Uh, I think it's called the hottest year in hell or something like that. It was a really interesting documentary, but it was about how 77 was this horrible year for New York City, yet it, the city was still New York City and it was a vibrant city with a lot of you know wonderful cultural changes and stuff. So on the one hand, you had the birth of punk rock music. There was this great punk rock club called CBGBs where Blondie and the Ramones and the New York Dolls like started punk rock music. And there was this cool movement there, but it was trashy and gross and disgusting and um, the worst years for New York City. If you want to see what New York City looked like in this era, you can watch movies like Taxi Driver or Death Wish where it was just atrocious. It was appalling. It was a New York City you guys wouldn't even recognize. What's happened in the last... 25 years since Rudy Giuliani became mayor of New York City, is New York City has had a lot of Republican mayors and liberal ones as well, but um, they've all agreed that crime was out of control and they needed to turn the city around. Manhattan now is incredibly gentrified and incredibly safe. In fact, uh, since 2005, I believe, there have been more murders on law and order that takes place in New York City than in the actual city of New York, right? Like I think Law and Order one year, they had like 57 murders and there were only like 40 in all of New York City uh, or all of Manhattan anyway, um, in, in the last 25 years. It's very safe and very expensive now. Now, what had happened was it was unbelievable. Um, Times Square was a very dangerous place. It's very touristy today. There's a TGI Fridays and an M&M store and it's very friendly now, an Apple store. But in the seventies, it was a bunch of adult movie theaters uh, prostitutes would walk the streets right there in Times Square. Drug dealers were out in the open just right there. You, If you were a tourist, you did not go to Times Square. It was dangerous. It's like when you go to San Francisco, they're like, stay out of the Castro. There's people literally shooting up heroin on the sidewalks right in front of you. And you don't want to be caught there after dark if you're a tourist. Stay the heck out. 
that's how Times Square was. Times Square, right? Which was just, in the 40s, it was where people would go and, you know, read the little crawl that would tell you the news and big congregations. When World War II ended, there were huge celebrations there. You couldn't go there after night. Um, the city had lost a million citizens in the 70s. Between 1970 and 1980, a million people left the city. It went from 8 million to 7 million people. They have since built back that population, but that is never a good sign. In the 1977 World Series in October, um, and I forget who played, but the, the Yankees played in 77. I think they lost that year. I might have been playing the Dodgers, I forget. But um, there's one moment where the Goodyear blimp zooms out to take an aerial you know, shot of, uh, of Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, and they catch seven huge apartment fires going on. And Howard Cosell, who was the announcer, announced that the Bronx was burning and started commenting and saying, who are these animals? Who are these people that burn down their own communities? Now, what was happening was this weird phenomenon in inner cities, like in Long Beach, where there's areas of Long Beach that are nice. There are areas of Long Beach that are dilapidated and run down. And even in those dilapidated run down areas, it's incredibly expensive to live here because we have a housing shortage, a housing crisis. New York City had the same thing in the 70s where rent was out of control, even in the slums. And a lot of these landlords uh, wanted to go fix up their apartment building. They would go down to the bank and say, I want to borrow you know, 200 grand so that I can fix up the plumbing because I have a hundred year old building and it's uh, terrible. And the bank would say, you're in a not so desirable area. You're in a red zone. We will not loan you the money to do that. And you didn't have the money to borrow it to do. And, you know, the rents as high as they are, aren't going to pay for all this stuff. And so what the landlord would do is send out a notice to all the tenants saying, be out of the building. We have to spray for cockroaches next week. And the landlord would just torch the building, collect the insurance, and then just move on. And what about all the tenants? They'd have to go find housing in an even more scarce market with even higher prices and even more difficult circumstances. New York City was constantly on fire in the 70s. There were fires everywhere all the time, which is incredibly sad and shocking and terrible. But that was New York. They went bankrupt in 1976 and asked for a bailout from the federal government. And at first the government said no, but then they finally turned around and said yes. But um, it was bad times for a city that never sleeps. So we talked about 76. Carter beats Ford. It's a very narrow race, but essentially uh, it wasn't sort of a revival of liberalism. What it was, was America, number one, voter turnout dropped incredibly low. People just tuned out. A lot of the people that were very political in the 60s after Watergate, Vietnam, they just said, it's all corrupt. Let's just disengage. And so you had this attitude in the 70s where happiness really lay in hedonism, in pleasure, right? Like, Happiness is not about helping the poor. It's useless. We learned through the 60s, you can't do that. All of these you know, endeavors we tried were failures. And so I'm gonna go to the club, I'm gonna dance all night, I'm gonna drink, I'm going to you know, snort cocaine, I'm gonna feel really good. I'm going to engage in promiscuity because in the 70s, there was no HIV yet and uh, birth control pill made it so that it, 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 unwanted pregnancy was not a problem. And so you had this culture emerge in the 70s that was incredibly hedon hedonistic. Um, and, and it was coupled with very high crime. So it was easy to see the two, right? Many conservatives would say, well, the problem with crime in America and the problem with the breakdown is the collapse of the family and the collapse of morality, right? Everyone's out dancing all night, doing drugs and having sex. And that's leading to the crime and the breakdown of, of social mores. They may have been right. I don't know. But, but there was a sort of anger at America's self and, a, and a, a sort of apathy about what to do about all of it. And we had stagflation. A new word came into our lexicon. Uh, Keynes was once asked at a lecture, what you do if you need to boost aggregate demand uh, to, cre you know, to create jobs, if you have a high unemployment. And he said, you borrow and you cut taxes and you spend like crazy. They said, well, what if you have high inflation? Uh, and the economy is overheated and everyone has a job, but prices are skyrocketing. And he says, you then uh, don't borrow, you then raise taxes and stop borrowing and you know things will calm down. And someone then asked him, what if you have both? What if you have high inflation and high unemployment, which do you do? And he said, that is impossible. These variables are inversely related. It's like a seesaw. One of them is up, one of them's down, has to be axiomatically. 
Well, Keynes died in the 40s. They could not revive him to ask him in the 70s, hey, this actually is happening now. We have high energy prices, which are fueling inflation, but it's also making interest rates rise so no one can borrow to build homes or anything. And uh, we have high unemployment too. So what do you do? No one had any answers. Nobody knew what to do. Bury your head in the sand and hope that it gets better eventually. Um, there was no answers to this. And so what eventually would happen is Keynesianism would fall apart and Reaganomics or, you know, uh, more conservative economics of deregulation would come about and seem to solve these problems. But in the 70s, nobody knew. Now, some people put a lot of faith in nuclear energy. They said, you know what? Um, oil emissions are really bad. Um, the, there was a huge oil spill off the coast of Santa Barbara. There's a huge oil platforms, you know, there drilling off the coast. And there was an explosion on one of them. And the, all the oil ruined the beach in Santa Barbara for years. And a lot of people started to say that we needed to get off oil that we need to have high fuel efficiency cars and then start to move into something else. And maybe nuclear could be part of this. And so U.S. in the 60s and 70s built a lot of nuclear power plants all around the country. You can see San Onofre, which I think is closed down. I don't think it works anymore, but it's just north of San Diego and San Clemente, the two domes that are off the side there uh, of the five freeway. And um, that seemed like a way out of it, that there's no emissions with nuclear. There's a lot of waste products, but you know, if you provide for safe storage and, and disposal, then it should be okay. And then we had Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island was a nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania, and they had a near meltdown. There was a leak in the reactor core. Luckily, there was a secondary dome over it. Um, one of the things that saved Three Mile Island is that it was in, in a direct flight path. And so because planes were flying over constantly, they had not only a primary dome, but a secondary one over it encased in lead in case there was a crack in the reactor core. And the crack happened. It was spewing radiation out, but it remained contained inside. There was worries there for a few hours that the outer dome might crack and it might spew radiation all over southeastern Pennsylvania. People started to evacuate Philadelphia. There was absolute pandemonium. Luckily, nobody died. Luckily, it you know did not become the tragedy of Chernobyl or Fukushima but it scared the hell out of Americans. It's very odd. Even though we've never suffered a nuclear meltdown, Americans are obsessed with it. I'm not sure where this comes from, but many people theorize it's about our sort of guilt about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You see that Americans are obsessed with nuclear energy. We watch these Godzilla movies about, you know, nuclear energy creating, you know, radio radioactive mutants. Every one of our superheroes, that's how they, you know, become superheroes. Spider-Man bit by a radioactive spider, the Hulk, you know, gamma radiation. Uh, Captain America, Vita Rays, whatever that is. And so Americans are terrified of nuclear energy. It's really interesting. The French get 75% of their energy from nuclear. America gets a tiny fraction of it. We haven't built a nuclear uh, power plant in America since March of 79. Since Three Mile Island, no one will build one. There's what's now called NIMBYism. NIMBY stands for not in my backyard. And here's how it works. Uh, anytime we want to build a power plant or a, an oil refinery or a nuclear power plant or expand a freeway, homeowners associations bind together and they sue the state or the federal government. They say, not in my backyard. Why? Because it's going to drive down my price values. No one wants to live next to a nuclear power plant. Who's going to buy my home? If you build that here, I'm going to sue you. And so this has become a really horrible thing. Uh, it's less a phenomenon in really conservative states like Texas. They just build wherever the hell they want to build, which can be good for the economy, but it, it leads to disastrous results for the environment. Like when they had the you know, hurricane three years ago, all of Houston flooded because they build in the middle of a floodplain. California won't let you do that. But California is the opposite extreme. You can't build anywhere here. So we have more homeless people than any state in the union. And we have a huge housing crisis. Housing is not even affordable. Um, and so America is just mired in problem after problem after problem. This is very prophetic that it's the day before Earth Day. Earth Day is tomorrow. The first Earth Day was 1972. Um, nobody had really thought of the environment before the 70s. Uh, the Industrial Revolution was only, you know, 150 years old at that point. Everybody had high hopes that, you know, technology would save the world. But starting in the 70s, scientists discovered climate change, 
they discovered that the ozone layer was being breached by you know toxic chemicals. Um, there, again, there was no catalytic, con catalytic converters in cars. LA was the smoggiest city on earth. Yay, what an honor. We're not anymore. Mexico City is far worse than us, and so is Mumbai, and so is Lagos, Nigeria. So we're much better now, but in the 70s, and when I grew up in the 80s, it was still really, really, really bad. We had smog days where they would close school and send us home because they just said it's not safe for children to be running around playing and breathing in all these toxic chemicals. Um, and Earth Day was created to encourage sort of a new movement, to encourage Americans. I remember when I was younger, we had to recycle on our own. We were not given recycling cans by the city. Um, no one I knew was a vegan or vegetarian. Uh, no one really thought about any of these kind of issues. I remember when I was a kid, uh, my dad, not my dad, but my dad's friend who lived down the street, he would change his motor oil and just dump it in the backyard. And we know now that's a terrible thing. It seeps into the water supply. I remember him doing it. And I, I told him, I said, we learned in school, you're not supposed to do that. And he said, son, don't you know where oil comes from? It comes from the ground. I'm just putting it right back where it came from. And I didn't have the knowledge of geology to, to clap back at him. But today I would say, yeah, but it wasn't taken out of your backyard and uh, <laughs> it was removed uh, in an area where it didn't corrupt the water table. Now it's going to corrupt the water table and get into our drinking water. People just didn't care about the environment and all kinds of issues started to come up. The oil spill in Santa Barbara, the smog in LA, all these issues came up. And so now environmental regulation, the EPA comes in and says, you got to put catalytic converters in cars. So now catalytic converters make the air much cleaner. We Nowadays, it's great. We have all these electric cars and hybrids and all that kind of stuff. The environmental movement really pushed that, which was a good thing, but it was shocking that Americans now realized we could actually pollute the earth so badly that it's unlivable. And that realization was shocking to us. The gold standard ended in 1972. What happened um, with all the inflation and the energy crisis was that Americans already could not buy gold. Only Europeans could. That was done to stabilize their currencies, which were pegged to ours. Um, and what happened was Europeans started to realize that with inflation, that the value of the dollar was decreased. There were more dollars than there was gold. And so some clever Europeans started hoarding and buying up all the gold. All the gold in Fort Knox started to leak out and go to Europe. And this created a bit of a panic. And Richard Nixon had no choice but in 72 to go off the gold standard entirely and just let the currency float in the open market which was terrifying for a lot of people and frightening and very symbolic. The dollar was as good as gold, everybody said. It was the foundation currency of the world. Even the Russians, I love this, Soviet, you know, powerful bigwigs would hoard dollars illegally because they knew their ruble was just worthless. It was a ridiculous currency. Their country was very poor. It was a poor country with nuclear weapons, which is why we had to respect them, but they couldn't compete with our economy. And now our dollar, wasn't as worthwhile as we thought it was. So th this was just a series of shocks in America, like what on earth is happening? How could this be happening to us? But it was, and there was just no denying it. So um, all of this gave rise to what was called at the time neoconservatism, a, a new conservatism. Republicans had largely been out of power since the 30s. Yes, we had Republican presidents like Eisenhower and Nixon, but both of them faced hostile Congresses, right? Eisenhower had a Democratic Congress pretty much every day of his presidency. So did Nixon. They had, and the whole paradigm had shifted, the Overton window, meaning the acceptable dialogue was a post-New Deal dialogue. Republicans weren't talking like 1920s Republicans, like let's get rid of Social Security and Medicare and everything. Um, but in the 70s, it seemed like liberalism had gone a bit too far. And so here's what many conservatives started to latch on to. Um, now, the heart of this was you had what you know some people call country club Republicans who had always been there, sort of Northeastern, New England, middle class and upper class, waspy Protestants who were always Republican and like, you know, guys that go out and they garden in like a full three piece suit with like leather gloves and listen to classical music only. That was the Republican party, but they couldn't win with just those people. They had to reach out to um, what I would call NASCAR Republicans. People that live in rural areas who are very religious, go to church quite often, have blue collar jobs, don't make a lot of money, are culturally conservative. Um, and um, 
those people typically voted Democrat because they were in a labor union. Now unions were dying and more and more Americans started to look away from the Democratic Party and say, I don't really see them as the party of unions. Ask yourself, do you think the Democratic Party is the party of unions or are they sort of the party of social justice, right? Like I've heard conservatives say it today that the Democratic Party is really the party of transgender rights, women's rights, African-American rights, Chicano rights. Where's the right of poor working class white people to make a better wage. That doesn't seem to be on the agenda for the Democratic Party, or at least it's muted. There's not a lot of like, you know, let's recruit people in Appalachia, in Kentucky who work in a coal mine and let's get them unionized and on our side. Democratic Party doesn't really reach out to them. Republican Party often reaches out to them, but through social ideas, right? Don't you hate abortion? Don't you hate how they're trying to pass gun regulations? Don't you hate how, you know, whatever, right? All, all of the uh, uh, cultural things that are changing, they're getting rid of Dr. Seuss books. And so that's the dynamic of today. And that starts really in the 70s with a social outreach to white working class people. They were angry at the Supreme Court. Poor and working class whites were the victims of crime in America. And uh, more and more, the crime rate was out of control. And it seemed like the Supreme Court was on this crusade to help the criminals, not the downtrodden, you know, a working class white person who got up and went to work every day. Um, and that seemed to be the, and the Democratic Party championed all these causes and said, aren't we great? We passed all these criminal justice reforms. Most people just said, why, why are you doing that? There was sort of a, a lionization of the vigilante. Kind of frightening how much Americans really look at vigil. Look at all of our superheroes. They are by definition vigilantes. Nobody deputized Batman and Superman to be crime fighters, but they go out and they do it. And um, in the 70s, we had these really frightening movies that came out where audiences cheered for the vigilante. Dirty Harry is about a cop, Clint Eastwood, who just takes the law into his own hands. He catches a guy who's basically the Zodiac killer, but the liberal judge lets him off because they didn't quite cross their T on the warrant. And so Dirty Harry just hunts down the criminal and shoots him at the end and throws away his badge and just says, you know, a real man just does what's right, which I guess is shooting uh, a serial killer, uh, you know, rather than trying to arrest him. Death Wish was even crazier. This was about a man who was an architect whose uh, wife is, uh, murdered and daughter is raped in a home invasion attack. And he kind of goes crazy and goes out on the streets and poses as sort of a target for criminals and then murders them. He goes on the subway and just kind of sits around and waits for young thugs to come up to him. And then he just blows them away. Audiences cheered at this because so many people had been the victim of a crime and it seemed like nobody cared. It seemed like all the Democratic Party wanted to talk about is, isn't it hard to be a woman or a minority in America? And a lot of white conservatives who had voted Democratic since FDR said, what about me? You guys are, you know, looking out for the criminals and I go to work and I support America and I, you know, I got a job and I'm getting kicked in the teeth every day because no one's looking out for me. Um, the middle class started to rebel against taxes. It, it's quite amazing the toleration Americans had for high taxes in the 50s and 60s, right? Or 91% upper tax rate for the rich in America. Now it's not entirely clear, but it seems like most middle-class and upper-class white folks were more okay with this when their schools were all white. But look at Milliken, as Milliken changed, all the people that live around Milliken are quite old and don't have kids of their own because houses are so expensive. They moved in 30 years ago when houses were affordable. And they don't see the students of, of Milliken today as, you know, uh, being from that community, being of, you know, deserving, because we, two thirds of our students are, you know, riding the bus from the West side. They come from higher densely populated areas. They tend to be more minority. And so one of the theories is that this group of people around Milliken has basically said, well, we don't want to pay these high taxes anymore, right? Do it on your own. And so there was, there's been this attitude throughout America where we used to be quite generous in the 60s and paid high tax. If you look at schools in the 60s, everyone could take music. We didn't have to beg people with donations. These silly things that they make my kid do at Bixby, like run the jogathon to raise money for the school. And every year I always ask the question, why don't we just tax people? We already are taxing people, but if you need more money then raise the taxes. I hate how I have to like pay in taxes and then I get shaken down by every one of my every one of my friends that has a kid is begging me on social media to donate money to them. And it's like, why don't we just fund our schools? Why are we always begging 
we don't have band uniforms and we need supplies. Why doesn't the school have the money? They did in the 50s and 60s. Well, we started to drastically cut taxes in the 70s. The tax revolt. Howard Jarvis and several other lawyers in California got really mad at the property tax rate. Now, the tax rate had not changed, but tax uh, revenue had increased because housing prices had skyrocketed. In the 70s, housing prices effectively doubled. Um, lots of people flocked to California in the 40s and 50s and bought these little bungalow cottages right by the ocean. And that little bungalow had drastically increased in price, which is good, but you have to pay the property taxes on it. And you pay that every year. And you're not a rich person. You just bought this house and you have to pay these insane property taxes. Now the property taxes are fueling the police and, and, and the schools, but it was out of your realm of possibility to pay for it. And so Prop 13 has passed in 1978. And ever since then, it's been kind of the sacred cow of California politics. You can't get rid of it. Prop 13 made it so that you could not increase property taxes and you could not increase the value under which they're assessed. Meaning like I bought my home in 2009. I bought it for $359,000, even though the home is much more valuable today. It's probably 540,000 today. Um, I pay taxes as if it was the same amount as when I bought it. So when they assess it every year, they go, when did you buy it? What, when, what did you buy it for? And it can only, the assessment value can only increase 1% a year, no matter how much the actual house is affordable. Now, this was great for taxpayers, but what it did is it absolutely strangulated the budget of schools. They slashed school budgets and police budgets all throughout the late 70s and 80s and 90s. And we're still struggling to find those revenue streams. California, we used to have the best school system in the country. Now it's one of the worst, I'm sorry to say, in terms of funding, in terms of access, we have to get more and more of our money from Sacramento and from Washington, DC, and less of it locally because taxes are so low here now. Um, people started to see after the great society and the riots and all of that, they started to see the poor is undeserving. If you asked a person in the 50s, you know, who are your property taxes going to? They're going to my neighbor and I like my neighbor. They're great people. In the 70s, people were said, who are your taxes paying for? I don't know, probably some person in the inner city that I don't like and is undeserving and is lazy and doesn't want to work. So I don't want to pay for it anymore. And so more and more you saw people shy away from buying into, you know, paying taxes. Conservatives also could not quite get on board with the sexual revolution. Now, America's this weird, uh, very, I would say, bipolar country when it comes to sexuality. If you guys are not aware, uh, America's much more conservative on certain things. So like in Europe, if you watch their TV and films, it's much more common to have nudity and sex in films. Their films typically don't have violence and a grotesque violence that we have. In America, it's the flip-flop. You can show as much violence as you want. You get PG-13, but if you show nudity or sex, it's immediately R and C-17. Um, yet, look at media. There's so much sexuality. That's how we sell everything, right? We use sex to basically sell our hamburgers and our sodas and everything else. And so it's this weird message. We tell teenagers, you should practice abstinence. Don't engage in premarital sex. But then you go home and you guys watch all these TV shows and and movies and videos uh, that show a high degree of sexuality in it. So it's very odd, but that's the America we're in. Half of America thinks that things are, you know, gone way too far. Another half of America feels, you know, why are you so uptight? We should have, you know, no restrictions. Um, this was a phenomenon of the sexual revolution in the 70s. And the sexual revolution basically means just everything with feminism, gender relations, but also just sexuality in general. So what that means is divorce was unthinkable in the, like if you had a neighbor that was divorced, you could not be friends with that neighbor because you would lose social standing. Everyone would gossip about you. Uh, you could not get pregnant out of wedlock in the fifties. Like if you were a young girl, 16, 17, and you got pregnant, you would have to move to a new town. Abortion was illegal. So you could risk your life and go get one. And what a lot of young girls did is they told mom and dad, mom and dad kicked them out. And you would go live with some distant auntie on the other side of the country and you would come up with a cover story. You'd basically say, uh, my husband died in Korea in the Korean war and this is our child. And that way maybe another man would marry you. But the saying at the time, and some people still use it, is that a woman was damaged goods if she wasn't a virgin on her wedding night and she had a kid out of wedlock. 
like a woman was a piece of property, right? Damaged goods. That's a horrible way to put it, but that was the way they put it. Nobody cares about this kind of stuff anymore, right? I mean, certainly your parents, I, I hope they care if you, you know, become pregnant or get somebody pregnant, but it's not the shameful act that it was in the 50s where they just, the whole society would shun you. Scarlet letter, right? It was like, you, you are damaged goods. You're a damaged person. And so it's horrible what we had to make young girls, you know, deal with in, in, in the 50s. That's very different nowadays. Sexuality on TV was hardly seen. Sex in movies was hardly seen. Um, books were heavily censored before this time. Um, people didn't live together before they were married. It was very common that you met someone, you got married within six months, and you both were probably virgins on your wedding night, and certainly hadn't slept with each other. That, that is just not the world we live in today. Um, this used to be called cohabitation or living in sin. We don't even have a word for it anymore. It's just what happens. First of all, dating is much longer now because we want to make sure that we like the person that we're with. And most of us decide to live with the person that we're going to marry, right? It's the metaphor is you test drive the car before you buy it. You got to see if the relationship works. What if they put the toilet paper roll on the wrong way? That's a deal breaker, right? What if they don't like the same foods you do? And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, what real intimacy is, and you can't really have this until you move in with someone, real intimacy is sharing a bank account and sharing finances. That's when really the skeletons come out of the closet and you find out how much credit card debt your partner has and how they spend money. And that's a deal breaker for a lot of people because some people are very thrifty and then other people like to spend a lot and you get them together and you have big fights about what you spend money on. In the 50s, people just got married and they figured it out as they went on. Divorce rates were low because you couldn't get divorced, right? You had to ask permission from your partner. Nowadays, this is kind of the screening process that we go through. We date someone for long periods of time, usually, you know, engaging in, in physical love with that person happens earlier on and, uh, and you get married down the road, but you're in a relationship much, long, much longer. It was a huge scandal if, if everyone in a community knew that a young woman was engaged and then broke it off, but had lived with a man and slept with him damaged goods. No man would marry you. It was like you were the town, bop, 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 whatever. I don't want to say the word, right? You were, you were the woman in town who was a lady of the town. We're a much different country. And many people have never gotten over those, those changes. And I'm not saying it's a good thing, bad thing. Again, I, I don't want to weigh in on this in terms of, is that good or not? But we're not the society that's as judgmental anymore. We're more accepting of these breaches of social protocol. Sometimes they're not even breaches anymore. Um, We've totally changed uh, everything. Uh, homosexuality, right? Even when I was a kid, there was no gay lesbian alliance at, at my school. I, I had friends that I were that I was pretty sure were gay, and it turns out they were. They came out, you know, later in their twenties. But you didn't dare come out at sixteen in Garden Grove, and that's not that far from Milliken. That's just thirteen miles away, and it was unthinkable. That was in the nineties. It's a much more open, tolerant environment to be gay in, in America today. I'm not saying it's great, but it's much better than it was. And in the 50s, it was just uh, all the AMA and doctors and the APA all agreed that homosexuality was a mental disorder. And gay people were closeted. They just didn't come out. They just lived a life in the shadows and were marginalized because of it. Because of it. And other people have the view, you know, uh, conservatives that homosexuality is abnormal and is a sin and we just tolerate it today and we shouldn't do that, that we should, you know, set standards for our kids and set standards for society. So um, there's people that never quite got over this. Um, same with pornography. Pornography was highly illegal in the 50s. It was distributed by the mafia. Um, it, it's it, because technology was so different because you had to film movies with camera uh, uh like you know on, on actual film stock and develop it in a lab and distribute it uh, in a lab pornography was very easy to kind of uh police so it was still produced uh you know where there's supply there's demand wherever people want a product you know people are going to find it and um it existed but it was run and distributed by the mafia uh along with prostitution and heroin distribution Highly, highly, highly illegal. Starting in the 70s, early 70s, this all changed. Movies came out in, in uh, pornographic movie theaters starting in about 1972. 
Now you could have these theaters in New York City, you could have them in San Francisco, you could have them in Hollywood. You weren't gonna build them in Indiana because you know the community wouldn't allow it there. Um, and, and, and the free speech standards at the time exempted obscenity, obscenity of pornography. It's something that's offensive to God and then you know it can be banned. And so they did. And in 72, the Supreme Court changed its mind and said, you know what? Um, there's no standard for obscenity now and you can basically show what you want. And that changed everything forever. Um, I'm old enough to remember when there was an adult movie theater in Buena Park. I certainly never went to it, but when I was a little kid, it, ex it was right down the street from Knott's Berry Farm, where like the Hollywood, or not the Hollywood, but the, the Movie Land Wax Museum is, and um, uh, Medieval Times and Porto's Bakery and all that stuff. There was an adult movie theater right there on Beach Boulevard. And I remember every time we'd take the 91 and get off at beach and go down to um, Knott's Berry Farm. I remember my mother just saying, I hate that place. I hope it burns down someday. And I didn't know what she was talking about until I was older. That existed just out in the open in many societies and people hated that. Other people went. Um, America's very different today with the internet, with you know videotapes that come along in the 80s and 90s. It, this kind of stuff is so, it, it, it's very shocking today to me, honestly, seeing the evolution from when I was a kid. When I was a kid, you didn't really see pornography that much. And perhaps that was a better way to grow up, I think. Um, sometimes be like, oh, my older brother has a magazine. We might sneak a peek at it when you're 12 or 13. And then you wouldn't see stuff for like months and years and stuff. Um, nowadays, it's just on the internet, it's you know wirelessly on your phone anywhere you go. It's really frightening how much that's just spread out to the community. Um, I saw a presentation on this on just the change between your generation and mine. That that really probably the biggest difference was that if you wanted to get information as a kid, there was a gatekeeper. There was some adult that got between you and that information. Nowadays, there's no gatekeeper. It's just the internet is incredibly empowering. You can learn about anything and find out anything you want to know but there's a lot of really awful stuff that's out there as well. And I very much sympathize with conservatives here. It's terrifying being uh, a parent now in, uh, in this era. I have a seven-year-old and I don't know how to shield him from this kind of stuff. I, I, you know, you try to raise a kid right, but I don't like that, that all that you put parental blocks, but people find ways around it. And it's, um, it's scary and I don't like it at all as a parent, but that's the way the world is now and that's the way America is. Some people lash back against it and say, we need to change it. Liberals just say, you know, don't be uptight. Just, you know, let people choose if they want to watch it or not. Conservatives are like, no, for the benefit of the community, we got to shut these things down. Okay, I am out of time here. I need to start class soon. So I'm going to see you guys later. It's great to be with you all. Um, this is a backup, so you don't have to listen to it. But, um, you know, hopefully you enjoyed it. We're midway through the 70s. We'll wrap this up next time, guys. Bye-bye.